figures for presenting their ongoing research in the field of serial molecular breeding and genetics. Cereals are very important crops in the world. It is the main source of food in the world. Molecular breeding is the most important tool that aims to improve the production and the productivity of crops. As a professor of plant breeding, I know very well that the genetic improvement of crops is a critical solution for keeping the food security of all countries safe. By using the of classic and the molecular breeding, we can change the genetic structure of the land and this obtain new genotypes characterized by high productivity and quality and able to adapt it with environmental changes such as drought, heat. In this symposium, state of art research in the field of serial molecular breeding and genetics will be presented by high profile international speakers. I am quite sure that you all will get great value from attending this international symposium, and I hope that it will open new research opportunities for all academic staff members and researchers to develop their research and increase their international network. Finally, I would like to express my profound gratitude to Dr. Ahmed Atif Salam. Dr. Mohammed Abdel Aziz and Dr. Amir Effet and the, uh, our young assistant team from our teaching assistants and postgraduate students who volunteer and worked very hard to make such an event successful. Thank you so much for your attention and wish you all the best during the symposium and I hope to see you in the next year at Asyut University or IBK in Germany. Thank you very much, and it was my best wish. So uh, this program today, just I will give you a small hints about the program. Uh, so we will have uh, uh, three lectures and then we will have coffee break for one hour and the coffee break including poster presentation. So the poster presentation outside, as you know. And then we will have uh, two uh, lectures and then we will have lunch break for uh, half and uh, one hour and a half. And then we will uh, end our symposium with more three uh, lectures. Okay, let's, uh, Muhammad Abaziz will be the moderator of the session. And uh, 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 I'd like to uh, introduce uh, the first speaker, Dr. Andres Bruna. Uh, Dr. Andres Bruna is the manager of the Bank, Germany, and he is also the head of the Department of Research and Genetics. Dr. Uh, Andres Bruna is a well known figure in the international environment of genetics and official serial genetics. Over 30 years of professional work at various positions, mainly at the IBK Japan City in Germany, brought him recognition and authority not only in the scientific community but also among the wide range of agricultural practitioners in this country and the world. Uh, Professor Gorda published more than 1400 publications uh, in high journals such as Nature and Science. Uh, for example, this year, on he uh, published of, uh, 29 articles uh, already published in high impact journals. Uh, Professor Gorda had many activities uh, in uh, this country, Germany, and in Abu as well. Uh, he is the president of the European Association for Research on Plant Feeding since 2016. And he is also the German country representative of the European Association for Research on Plant Breeding uh, since 2012. Chairman of the European Association for Research on Plant Breeding uh, since 2010. Uh, German representative of the working group lead of the European Cooperative Program for Plant Genetic Resources since 2014. Uh, member of Seed Storage Committee. Of the International Seed Testing Association since 2010. Uh, and now uh, I would like to put uh, 
Thank you very much, Mohammed, for this nice introduction. <clears throat> and uh, before I start the scientific presentation, I would like to say that I'm very glad to be here again and uh, to be back in Asyut, to be in Egypt, back in Egypt, having such a great history. It's amazing if you look back two, three, four thousand years ago. So it's always impressive for me. And I would like to say hello to everybody. Salam Alaikum. And uh, could we? Yes. So my presentation <clears throat> will deal for the, the title of the presentation, you can see here, Molecular Tools for the Characterization and Utilization of Plant Genetic Resources. And uh, I will divide this presentation into four parts, as you can see on this first slide. So first, I will give some overview about plant genetic resources on our globe. So what is stored where? Then, of course, I need to say something about the German ex situ collection at the IPK in Gattersleben, and I will give examples on research, molecular study studies on seed longevity. I will explain what does that mean, and molecular studies on abiotic stress tolerance, and some, con some conclusions and outlook. So what's going on on our globe? So there are in the global gene banks, about 7.4 million accessions stored worldwide. And 130 of these uh, uh, 1,700 gene banks have more than 10,000 accessions. And if you look here, this is Egypt. This is the gene bank. It also belongs to 130 big accessions. But what I did on this slide, I did highlight the largest collections in this light blue color. And the largest collections worldwide are in the US. Then in Mexico, there is an international weed and maize uh, breeding institute. Then we have the gene bank at the IPK in Gattersleben, which is under the top 10 worldwide, and which is the largest one within the European Union. Then we have the national gene banks in Russia, we have had a gene bank here in Aleppo in Syria, but unfortunately, due to these problems during the last years, it had to move to Morocco. Then we have the national gene banks in India and in China, uh, Japan and the Philippines. And then we have this red color here. This is a special gene bank. This is a gene bank which was built on the so-called Svalbard Islands in the north of Europe, I will come back to this a bit later. If you look for the numbers which are stored in these banks, you see that the largest one is in the US, followed by China, India, Russia, Japan, Mexico, Germany. And if you look for the crops which are stored in the banks, it becomes clear that the two crops feeding the world, wheat and rice, also having the highest numbers of accessions in our gene banks, followed by rice, barley, maize, bazillus, bean, garden bean, uh, sorghum, soybean, oat, groundnut, and cotton. So these are the big crops stored in the banks. Okay, this is the global view on our gene banks. What's going on, or I want, would like to introduce to you now the German ex situ collection at the IPK Gattersleben. And several people of you know this institute, the IPK, and also the gene bank very well. So Ahmed Salam, for example, is, uh, is visiting right now our institute and working there. Amira Murat, but also Mohammed Zayed did uh, uh, spend time with us. But all the others probably do not know a lot about our bank, so I would like to use this chance to introduce you into it. Yes, here you see our campus. This is the IPK campus. This is my institute where I come from, and also Matthias is working there at the moment. 
And uh, right in the center of this campus, there is the gene bank department. So this is our gene bank and the rather new building here. I hope you can recognize also from the back. This is our cold storage. Here we are storing the seeds. And then you see here we have a lot of glass houses, very small ones, bigger ones, used for the regeneration of the material because you need to regenerate from time to time. And here a view on our experimental fields. If we look for the crops again, you will recognize that again the cereals and the grasses are the biggest crop group of material. And within this, for example, wheat, barley, oat, but also triticale and rye, for example. Then we have a lot of legumes, 30,000 legumes, beans, pisum, vegetables, tomatoes, onions, beets, oil and fiber crops, medicinal spice plants, forage crop, potatoes and others. So what we are storing in our bank, these are crops of agricultural and horticultural crops from the temperate zone. So you will not find any tropic crop in this bank. You will not find banana, you will not find coffee, you will not find rice. For rice, there's a huge gene bank on the Philippines, for example, having 120,000 accessions, but only rice, it makes it somehow easier. We in our bank, we have more than 3,000 different species belonging to the 800 genera, so this makes it also rather difficult to maintain. And with this high diversity of species, we are also, besides the U.S. gene bank, one of the most diverse gene banks. There is a huge reference collection comprising 420,000 herbarium sheets and also cereal spikes. And very important, we have implemented a so-called quality management system. That means all processes going on in the bank are very well documented. To add that everybody, everyone knows how to do, what to do with a certain accession, so that we could have a continuous quality of the maintenance of this material. Where does the material come from? From collection missions. You see here some of them listed, and the oldest material in the bank was collected in the 1920s of the last century, or the, the 20s of the last century. So now about 100 years old. And then during the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and so on, there were a lot of collection missions in areas where today it's completely impossible to go. So, for example, Ethiopia, North Korea, Iraq, Cuba, Libya, and so on. So there's a lot of material in our bank. I looked a bit more in detail and wanted to find out what's, do we have also material from Egypt? Because I'm visiting you, I, I, sh I should know. And uh, I found that there are about 500 accessions which are originated from your country. All right, we are here in Asiut at the moment. And uh, most of the material we have is Svizia Faba, about 230 accessions, but also some wheat and some barley, which is originated from your country. Yes, how we store the seed. This brings me now to some uh, 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 procedures we are doing. This brings me to the quality management system. Of course, you cannot read this. This is a so-called working instruction for seed storage. So I will explain how we store the seed. So we have a so-called active sample, which is stored as minus 18 degrees Celsius in such glass jars, in big shelves. Right, we have the basic sample stored in a different way in aluminium bags under vacuum because we know now today that if you store the seed under vacuum, it will survive. And in fact, is a triplicate we are sending to the Svalbard Islands. What does it mean, Svalbard Islands? This is a group of islands here, in the, even in the north of Norway. There is permafrost. This is good for storing the seed. Yes, and there, was a, there is a tunnel into the frozen rock, and there the seeds are stored. 
I was lucky I could visit this place. You see me here on the left side with two of my colleagues in, in February 2020, just two weeks before the lockdown came. And uh, it's a really very, very impressive place. And we're using this to store our safety duplicates there. We have right now 64,000 accessions packed in such boxes for safety reasons. What else is necessary for gene bank management? The regeneration or reproduction. You have to reproduce the material from time to time. You cannot store it for an unlimited time. Seeds are dying. So we have each year between six and 8,000 accessions. The greenhouses or field, we have in vivo maintenance, and we have to provide material for the herbarium. Distribution of the material, of course, do not just keep the material for our own. We are distributing it. And uh, in the last year, we did distribute, as you see here, about 14,000 samples to institutes from all over the world. Unfortunately, I must say, unfortunately, it is at the moment not possible to, to send any seed to your country. We had some orders, but when we did send it, uh, it returned back or we got the information it will not be distributed, we will destroy it and so on. So we cannot really send any material to Egypt at the moment, but we found other ways. Within, in our luggage we can bring something <laughs> for your research. So what to do? We have to, we have to solve these problems. Yes. And uh, if you look for the distribution you see here, it went up in 2016 to 50,000 samples a year. This number was not manageable anymore because uh, to take out 50,000 samples per year, to pack it, to send it, and we decided we, we have to change something. So we introduced the so-called handling fee. That means from 2017, people have to pay two euro per accession handling fee plus 10 euro per shipment plus costs for phytosanitary certificate. If you send material out of the European Union, you need such a phytosanitary certificate. And you see the number of orders went back. Again, we are now again between 15 and 20,000. But there are exceptions, and here your country is lucky, again, which are still free of charge. So these are countries they, they do not have to pay, and you see Egypt is listed here. So uh, for you, the material is free, but we cannot send, as I told you. So anyway, yes. What else uh, in the gene bank management? We started uh, about three, four years ago to genotype whole collections. So where there was genotype the whole box collection, parts of the Phaseolus collection, Lycopers and tomato, capsicum and also uh, eggplant. And in doing this, we will be now able to do some rationalization. So checking these gen genotypic data here, and I will zoom in, you see that these two accessions really look very much the same. So the question is, are these duplicates? And uh, but we do not the decision just based on on this genotypic data. We take then here and grow it in the field again and compare. Is it really the same? And can we save labor and money in the maintenance of of these accessions by eliminating some? Good. So this was a whole a big introduction, more or less, into the gene bank management. But I think it's important. Uh, it is important. For you to know what I'm talking about. And I come now to the examples on research and I start with studies on seed longevity. So what is seed longevity? Seed longevity is uh, the fact how long a seed can survive. This is very important for the gene banks but also for breeding companies selling the seeds to know how long a seed will survive. Right? And uh, we started to do some investigations with material which was stored under so-called ambient conditions, 20 degrees Celsius, 9 to 10% uh, moisture content. 
and uh, the results I present here to you now. So what we have in this graph, we have here the germination in percent, and we have here the seed age in years. And the red line is the so-called P50 value. That means germination dropped down to 50%. And you see this takes place in wheat after around seven years. In rye, it's a bit short. Rye is a, is a, a cereal which is mainly grown in Eastern, Northern Europe for bread making. Uh, but anyway, the, the P50 value is only six years. And if you look for maize, Wow, it's 12 years even, so maize survives quite long. Two more examples, lettuce, lactuca, very short living, P50, around four years. After six years, the seed is dead, right? But the peasum, garden pea, have a P50 14 years. And after 20 years, it still may germinate. So what does it mean? It means... There is an interspecific variation, so the species are responding in a different way with respect to seed survival. If you look for the pisum again, you see in the beginning we have a rather small variation, and after 15 years or so we have a huge variation. That means after 15 years you still have accessions having 95% of germination, others went down to zero. So Means besides this interspecific variation, there is an intraspecific variation. There's variation within the species. So we cannot say, okay, you can store wheat for 15 years, feed them for 20 years. No, we have always this variation here. Okay, 20 degrees Celsius, but we store our seed on the cold storage. I told you this at minus 18 degrees. Some of you went into our cold chambers. It's really cold, Amira. I'm right. Yes, okay. So, and uh, our cold store was built in the 1970s. So, the oldest material is from harvest 1974. Many of you are younger than this time, I guess, here in the audience. It's around 50 years now, the seeds. And we have germination data with, uh, about 160,000. And we did analyze this material, of course, also. And what you see here now, and diagrams, but they look a bit different. But anyway, the red line is important. It's again 50% germination decline. And you see, you can easily store wheat for about 40 years, maybe even 50, 60 years under such conditions. So it's very well to uh, uh, preserve and very well uh, yeah, conserved. Barley looks different. Yeah, barley looks the same, sorry. Again, most of the accessions from the different years reaching 40 years. But now, if you look for rye, rye is different. It's fine for 15 years, for 20 years, but after 30 years, we have again this huge variation. Again, we have accessions still having 90%, others went down to zero. And now comes the important point. You should you should know that this material from this particular year was grown on the same field, side by side, was harvested and thrashed with the same machines, with the same equipment, and then it went to the cold storage, sitting side by side in the shelf. So the environmental conditions were more or less the same. But why we have such difference? So our conclusion was there is a genetic factor. There are genetic factors influencing this trait. And we decided to start genetic analysis to find out how we could we identify genes which are responsible for the death of the seed. We use different methods. No time to go into detail. So these are so-called artificial aging uh, methods. You treat the seed with high humidity or high temperature or high uh, oxygen pressure. And uh, we started to do some experiment with barley. We took material which was already genotyped. We did regenerate it in the field, as you see, as you see here. And we got a nice variation. 
the population was already genotyped, and uh, we were able to find loci responsible for the trait. Yes, so we have here the chromosome. And whenever you have such a peak here, that means in this area there must be a gene or genes responsible for the trait you are investigating. In our case, germination after artificial aging. So we were able to find loci. We did a similar study in rye, uh, in wheat, sorry. And the interesting point here was that the red arrows are always loci for seed longevity, so for survival of the seed. And this green one here is a different one. This is the locus for dormancy. So dormancy is a special trait that if a seed is freshly harvested, uh, it does not germinate. And the, many people are supposing that if a seed has a long dormancy, it also has a long longevity, survival. But this seems not to be the case because these are different loci we found here in weeds. This was some early study. Recently, we, we did we genotype the same population and we were able to detect the same loci, but also some new ones. Okay, so this is we did some study in tobacco together with colleagues in Poland. Again, we were able to find genetic loci for the trait. And uh, we also did studies in all seed rape. And in fact, this was a work which was done by a, by a, a student from Egypt. My alarm, who was uh, doing her PhD with me. And the interesting point here is that we had seeds from three different experimental years. The same population was grown in different years. And uh, I hope you can identify the colors. We have blue, red, and green. And if you look for the loci for the QTLs, you see the red ones, the blue ones, the green ones, they are not always in the same positions. So that means the trait or the survival of the seed depends on the growing conditions of the mother plants. Right? So if the plant has very good condition, the seeds may survive longer. If it has poor condition, it will die earlier. And uh, this was very nice studies. We were able to publish several papers on this, on different crops. And very recently this year, we, we published a review about all this genetic studies, so genetic aspects on molecular causes for seed longevity in plants. And uh, we reviewed or we, we listed all the work which was done so far in Arabidopsis, rice, wheat, barley, maize, soybean, lettuce, tobacco, and tomato. There was no Vistia faba so far, so it could be some interesting point. And uh, yeah, so if you're interested in this, just have a look there. Yeah, so we found loci responsible for seed longevity, but it, did, it didn't give us really an information what's the reason for this seed dying. And we decided to do some other studies, some metabolite profiling. Not myself, I am a gene bank manager, but I have with colleagues from IPK, we did such a study. We, we used seeds which were harvested between 1998 and 2008. And we did the germination test and the colleagues did the metabolite profiling of this material. And this is what they found. To me, it looks somehow like modern art, you know, like a painting. But no, it's not a, not a painting. The, all these dots uh, uh, gives you um, uh, indication for lipids or oxidized lipids. It's the so-called, they call, they call it the wheat lipodome. 20,000 chromatographic features. And then we looked for correlation to germination. So 11,000 were either positively or negatively correlated with the trait. Here is one example. This is the so-called O1 diacyl glycerol. Whatever that means, I don't know. I'm not a biochemist. But anyway, we, anyway, we find a very strong correlation. I have no time to go into details. You can read it in the publication. This and another method that we use the so-called delayed luminescence to correlate this with the germination 
as well. And uh, uh, to, to, to make the story simple, you, you put a, a flash of light onto the seat and in the way as it comes back, we try to, to correlate this uh, with the viability of the seat. So the method is used in food science. So they use it for, for fruits, for example, to find out is it a fresh fruit or is its fruit already mm, two weeks old? But it was only rarely least, uh, used for seeds, and we try now to establish such a method as well. So this brings me now to the, the last point, the studies on apoiotic stress tolerance. Also here, I will present a few examples, uh, examples to you. I start with something which is completely unknown in Egypt, frost tolerance. Frost tolerance in wheat. You know, in Germany, we may have during winter time, we may have uh, down to minus 20 degrees Celsius for one or two nights, not, not the whole period, but we may have very cold spots during the winter. And uh, so we need a winter hardiness or frost tolerance. So we did start to evaluate uh, 276 feed accessions frost tolerance in wheat. So this is the fro wheat population. Matthias knows very well. It was genotyped with a uh, 90K chip and 40,000 markers were polymorphic. Anyway, so we were able to do, to run a so-called GWAS genome-wide association study. We were able to find regions in the genome responsible for this Frost tolerance, not killing the seed at minus 20 degrees Celsius, very important. And you see something here on chrom from, from one year on chromosome 1b, something on chromosome 7b, and in another year, again, we found this one here on 1b. So this seems to be really something interesting. So this was the frost. Drought, again, something very important for you. And here we did also some study in wheat with 100 spring wheat accessions. You see where they were originated from. And uh, yeah, we do not really have drought in Germany. We have some dry summers, of course, during the last season, but not the drought stress I, I have seen here. So what to do? We had to do, we had to use some method of yeah, let's say artificial drought stress. So we used a method which was developed already in the 1980s and which is called chemical desiccation. So you spray the plants with potassium iodide and uh, after two weeks treatment, uh, it's difficult, hard to see, you see differences. So we have a control, two control rows and two um, uh, treated rows. And with the spraying, you kill the, the chlorophyll. And without chlorophyll, the plant can't do any assimilation. So this is comparable to drought. It's also the chlorophyll is, is dying. So the yield, which could be realized finally, comes from the reserves of the stems. Yes, we call it stem reserve mobilization. And uh, if you look for the grains, you see here the control and uh, the chemical desiccated material and the same game so running running uh, 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 genome-wide association analysis and uh, yeah here you see all the, the different loci makes no sense to go into detail and to discuss this it is it's published or was published Two years ago or something like that you can have a look unfortunately it's difficult to see but you can ask me if you are interested drought tolerance in barley also important point again the same game we used uh, 184 genotypes uh, yeah genotypes or accessions which were genotyped within so-called 9k chip and here you see the markers on the chromosomes and some phenotypic data the kernels the distribution of the thousand grain weight, and again the map with the low side. 
So, and this is also published, was also published. And uh, with, this, with these examples, I wanted to show you that we really can use, using these modern molecular methods, we are able to detect loci in a broad range of material like we have in the gene bank. Barley, we have 20,000 barley in the gene bank. We don't know anything about it. Which one is, is, is uh, drought tolerance, which, which one has a good quality. It, you know, it was collected and stored. Now we are able to start to unlock this genetic diversity. And I would like to draw your attention to this review here, to this, this paper, which was uh, mainly uh, done by Ahmed, Salam, and colleagues. And uh, this, uh, there is very nice described how to perform that GBOS analysis. I took the figure from your paper, Ahmed, and uh, so you start with a diverse collection. Yes, of course, you have to do the phenotyping. Yeah, this is a late intensive part. You have to do the genotyping. This is not so difficult. You just need some, some money. You, pay, you, you bring the, the DNA to a company and they do it. Of course, you need the money. Yeah, but it's then done quickly within four weeks. So on. You have to uh, deal with population structure and so on. And then you do this association. Study and if you are lucky, you are able to find to find regions or genes responsible for the trait. So and with yeah yeah with this I'm I'm at the end of the, the presentation, and I just want to stretch one thing. Uh, when I came last time here, I didn't know anybody personally here in this audience. When I now I came back, I came back not only to the conference, I also came back to friends I have. Ahmed. Mohammed, Amira, and uh, we work together now since two years. And I just have give some examples here on uh, publications we did during this time. So there are quite a few, and uh, I I'm very happy to collaborate with the people from your university. It's a very efficient thing. So conclusions and outlook very quick. I did show you that there is a huge amount of accessions stored in the global ex situ gene bank, 7.4 million. Is it enough? Do we need more? I can't answer this question. Storability, longevity of the germplasm is limited. Seeds are dying. I know many gene banks, they have collected a lot of material, just put it in the cold storage, but didn't regenerate any time. So I'm sure this material slowly dies, but what to do? There's inter and intrastic variation for longevity. There are genetic loci for this trait. The pit oxidation events seem to be responsible for the seed death, and genetic resources are the basis for collaboration work on molecular studies. And with that, I'm at the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, for the great speech and the significant information about impact and the seed source. And now um, we are time for questioning. Uh, Yes. Yeah, we, we, we did start it, of course, to, to, to select some of such examples. And as I told you, uh, they were identical from the genotypic data. We brought them to the field to compare them. But then we found still some differences in some of these accessions. So you need really both. You need the genetic data, but don't uh, 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 forget the field evaluation. I think this, this is still very important. Yes. Yes, sure. You should be called.
no of the time it's one single gene which is important of this accession i'm personally don't like this uh, screening for the duplicates but the people giving us the money they they want to save money so we have to do it somehow Yes, I know this. How <laughs> they didn't use the cook oil, they didn't use. How, how can you explain? Unfortunately, I cannot explain this. Uh, of course, these studies were published first time in the 1960s, 70s. I'm not sure if this is really seed from this ancient time or seed which were later on brought somehow by animals there. Or personally, my experience with seeds is that at certain times they will die. It doesn't matter if it is in cold storage or wherever. So I don't want to uh, uh, say that you, the people which did this experiment, they did something wrong also. But I'm, I don't know. I, I personally don't really believe it. But yeah. Yeah, just one look. Four minutes. Yes. And uh, 